do not get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless indiscretion. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Hi, I'm Roy White, pastor of St. Mary's United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us today for staying connected. We're continuing our journey through the book of Ephesians. And there, there in chapter 5, verse 18, Paul utters those words. Do not get drunk but be filled with the Spirit. In, in my Bible, there's the little subheading over those verses, verses 18 through 21, and it's titled, In Relation to the Holy Spirit. I think the editor missed it just a little bit. And I think that could be better titled, In Relation to Drunkenness. Christian denominations vary on what they believe and practice about uh, alcohol. There are some denominations who believe that any alcohol at all for a Christian is a sin. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, there are some denominations that alcohol is very much an accepted part of any congregation gathering, uh, even, even uh, as a part of, of, the, of a church function or program. I was asked just this week about where we stood as United Methodist. Our social principle states that uh, alcohol ought to be abstained from because of the impact that it can have on individuals' health, uh, their family, and, and the home uh, in general. Some people will cite what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5, where he addresses his protege, Timothy and says, stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Some will take that as Paul's license to drink, but if you, if you take a careful reading of that, you notice that Paul uses the word use a little wine meaning that it's to be under our control. Uh, and he's also using this from a medicinal standpoint because of uh, maybe Timothy's uh, issues with his stomach and frequent illnesses. And so therefore, he was encouraging him just, just, just to take a little wine for, for those conditions. But in Ephesians 5, Paul says that drunkenness leads to a stoia which is the Greek word that means loss or without, or to use another word, wantonness. Is it, is it an absolute that whoever gets drunk, it will eventually lead to being without? Well, the answer to that question is no and yes. It does not automatically lead someone to lose their family, their home, their careers, their wealth. It does not automatically lead to that. But also the answer to that question is, yes, it does. It does cause us to lose a sense of our self-control. Uh, we lose inhibitions when someone gets drunk. Uh, there's a release of dopamine in the brain that leads to um, actions that we normally may not uh, engage in. Uh, it can lead to individuals doing and saying and acting in ways that they would never do if they were sober. A pastor acquaintance of mine told me years ago that... Uh, Without exception, every couple that came to him for marriage counseling, alcohol was involved in some form. It was either the reason they were there or it was a contributing factor to the reason that they were there in his office. And oftentimes uh, it was there because the marriage was in trouble and headed for divorce. As a follow of Christ, our lives are to be honoring to God. And one of the ways that we honor God is the way we live our lives. And where we are faithful witnesses to the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
And in, in addition, there are health reasons why we ought to abstain. And there's also relational reasons why we ought to abstain. Paul's antidote to getting drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Being drunk never accomplishes anything good. Being filled with the Spirit, that always leads to things that are good. A much better and healthier way of life and living with, with others in our community and in our families. So instead of uh, getting drunk, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Be under the influence of Jesus' light rather than Bud Light. I love the song, One Day at a Time. Not the One Day at a Time Sweet Jesus version, but the Joe Walsh version, which tells of his journey of sobriety. That, that wonderful song begins with the words, I was always the first to arrive at the party and the last to leave the scene of the, of the crime. He goes on to say, I got down on my knees and said, hey, I just can't go on living this way. It was something he was too blind to see, and he got help from something greater than me. And today, I learned to live my life one day at a time. There is help for those who struggle with, with addictions. There are 12-step programs. If you are in a place where you see addiction becoming problematic, and maybe people are telling you that, but maybe it's time that you begin to hear that. Reach out to someone and seek help. If you don't know anyone to reach out to, call our church office. There, there are individuals in our church who have reached out to me and said, if there's someone struggling in that area, that they want to be available. So I hope you'll hear and receive that with grace. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for your presence in our lives and the work of your Holy Spirit to lead us in paths of righteousness and holiness and Lord, in paths of peace and joy. And Father, I pray for those who may be struggling in the area of addiction. And we ask that you would so work in their lives that they would see the hope that is theirs in Christ. And so Father, uh, help them to reach out for help, knowing that they can't do this journey alone, that they would find those who would walk along with them. Father, hear our prayer we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Hope you'll join us for worship on Sunday. We worship at 1030. We're currently worshiping in our fellowship hall because of renovations going on in our sanctuary. Uh, if you're new to our campus, you'll see signs out front directing you to the entrance to uh, our fellowship hall. But we hope you'll join us for worship as you're able. If you're not able to be with us in person, join us online on Facebook and our YouTube channel. Have a great day and a great weekend. God bless you. Bye-bye.